Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to ProMed's webinar on working on TV and film production sets. It's just turned seven o'clock. Just going to give everybody another minute to join us this evening. Uh, as I can see, a few more people are just jumping into the waiting room, and then we'll get started shortly. And good evening again, everybody. My name is Max. I'm the Managing Director of ProMed. I'm your presenter for tonight's webinar, where we're going to be looking at working on TV and film production sets. Myself and many of ProMed staff have a lot of experience on working in TV and film. It's a bit of a growth area at the moment. Um, with COVID um, having put a bit of a stop to many events, um, a lot of our staff are becoming more and more familiar with uh, TV and film productions, um, although we're aware that not everybody is, um, has that experience quite yet. Um, we've also noticed that um, with a lot um, of the productions um, following various guidelines, the need for medics to be um, on sets um, is very much more of a requirement than it used to be. Film and TV industry were always very good at having medics available. Um, but now even the smaller kind of features, the smaller jobs um, are now attracting medics um, in addition. So for those of you who don't know about ProMed, ProMed started in 2017. Uh, we were a private limited company um, and we've grown mainly on word of mouth and recommendation. Uh, so a lot of our clients have recommended us to uh, their contacts who are looking for medics. Uh, we're also quite uh, popular on social media and that's how we've grown our business. Uh, we've been very careful with how we've grown and uh, I'd like to think that we are quite successful because we pride ourselves on our reputation and uh, therefore by investing in our staff, ensuring that we deliver a good quality service, that's why we get uh, repeat custom and that's why we get the recommendations. So just kind of following on from that, um, if you are interested in joining our team, um, especially if you uh, have got a little bit of experience already in the film and TV world, um, or you're willing to do uh, one or two unpaid observation shifts with our team just to get that uh, first-hand experience, um, that'll be great. We are a living wage employer, so we do pay 11.75 per hour outside London or 13.50 an hour inside London. Um, at the minimum, um, our day rates are there for 150 outside of London or 170 inside of London, up to 12 hours work if we're paying on a day rate. We're also a signatory to the prompt payment code, which means we pay everybody within 30 days. And we're currently on the lookout for first responders, so your FREC 3, your equivalents or high certificates, and emergency medical technicians, so your FREC 4 or equivalent or higher qualifications. If you'd like an application form, we'd like to know a little bit more about what we do, just drop us an email to apply at promed999.co.uk and one of our recruitment team will um, get back to you either tonight or tomorrow. Uh, we are very diligent when it comes to recruitment, so we do do our due diligence. We do follow up um, all certificates with uh, awarding body to make sure they're valid. We do check uh, everybody's DBS on the update service is, um, is up to date and still doesn't show anything new. Um, we can carry a DBS if people need us to. We do do your right to work check for the United Kingdom. Um, we do check that your CPD portfolio is up to date. Uh, we do do identity verification. You know, we're not just somebody who looks at um, a few certificates on an email and, and just files them away and forgets about it. Uh, we do everything properly, including video interviews. There's a couple of people uh, in the webinar tonight who I can see have been part of our um, recent recruitment process. Um, and then this is how we ensure that we keep the work that we get. So when we are working on the film and TV world, 
um, the production managers and producers who are contracting us know that the staff that we are supplying to them are staff who we have checked out and are absolutely 100% kosher because at the end of the day, as, as a production company, they're also liable for any freelancers um, or otherwise that are on their set. And they do get uh, more than their fair share of inspections from authorities. So admin team have already posted this in the chat, but just to remind you, if you've been here before, you've heard this, um, but all of our training events, whether physical or delivered electronically, um, are spaces that are free from bullying, intimidation, harassment. Uh, we believe that everybody has the right to be treated with dignity, respect and courtesy and not be discriminated against. So what we mean by that is, you know, some of the things that we're going to say, some people will have different opinions, different thoughts on how to do things. That's absolutely great. Uh, we welcome all input. Um, we just ask that if people are disagreeing with one another or indeed disagreeing with me, then just show that respect and courtesy. It's all about constructive criticism, constructive feedback and learning from each other. We are very much keen to learn from each other. Uh, we welcome challenges to our thought processes, our thinking, our rationale, um, because actually that's how we learn. And that's how we improve collectively. Um, if you are concerned by any particular person's behavior, uh, drop admin team a message or after the webinar, just email webinars at promed 999com Code at UK, and we will pick that up um, by joining Zoom. You have had to log into Zoom, so we do have a record of everybody's email address and name as they came in. So tonight, specifically, we're going to be looking at um, what it means to work on TV and film production sets, and the kind of vital pieces of information that you need to know. So no matter what kind of set you're working on, whether it is a one-day um, commercial advertisement whether it is a three or six month long feature film and you're doing the build and break, um, whether it is on location, whether it's in a studio, no matter what kind of, of set that you find yourself on, we're looking at the things that are uncommon, the things that are really gonna help you um, know a little bit more. Um, we're gonna be looking at the, the departments that you're gonna encounter. We're gonna be looking at the terminology that different people might use when referring to things. We're going to look at uh, the radio communications protocols, um, what the expectations are of medics, so what production or what the departments are going to think that you're going to be doing, um, and whether that's right or wrong. And obviously, in, in the current day and age, it would be wrong to ignore COVID-19 because actually the, the big rise in the need for medics in TV and film is because of COVID-19. So there's obviously some protocols and some discussion points to be had around that. So first of all, let's start and take a look at some of the departments. So the most important department is the production department. So these are the ones who um, contract a medical provider. So usually they will come in through a provider where one of the few um, departments where they won't use freelancers who they know. Um, they will always tend to go to a reputable medical company who can provide them with the insurance, with the health and safety policy, uh, with a commitment to being able to provide staff at short notice, um, with the relevant documentation to prove that those that have been checked out because that takes that kind of headache away from them and it just makes it a bit easier for them. So in production, uh, that includes your um, producer or possibly your executive producer. It includes your production manager. So your production manager tends to be your first point of contact. So if you're unsure of where you're supposed to be or what they need you to do or the order that things are happening on a particular day, the production manager is probably your first point of contact. So they're the client representative as far as we're concerned as a medical provider. Um, they're the ones that we go to. And from a back office point of view as a, as a manager, um, the production manager is usually my first port call when it comes to, I can't remember who I'm sending my invoice to. Um, they're the person who will send out the call sheets usually. Um, they're the person who, who we have the most communication with. Um, they're a kind of centre point where everybody kind of feeds in and then they feed out. So they're the kind of communications hub. Within, within the production department, you'll also find runners. So runners are basically our best friends. Um, they are actually the most junior position on any given film set. Um, and they're managed by usually the production department or possibly if they are set runners, then they'll be managed by the first assistant director. 
Um, and then their job is to move stuff, transport stuff, and then that could be scripts, it could be radio batteries, it could be um, bits and pieces that, that people need. Between the production office, the unit base, and the set, uh, it might also be going out and getting stuff. So if the first AD decides that he wants a frappe latte, then a runner will be sent to go and get a frappe latte. If a member of the cast suddenly decides that they don't want what they ordered for lunch, then you can bet your bottom dollar that uh, it will be a runner who is going out to wherever the cast has decided they want to eat from that lunchtime. Um, next department that we're going to kind of concern ourselves with is the lightning and electrical or sparks um, department. Um, they're also usually the first to arrive and the last to leave. Um, they have a lot of big and heavy equipment. Um, so as far as we're concerned, they are probably one of the more at risk departments in, in terms of can they injure themselves and can they injure themselves seriously? Uh, lightning and electrical is pretty much top of my list. Um, the, the lightning units they handle, the, the weight of the stands they handle, it's quite substantial. They're usually the ones with the lorries with the tail lifts, uh, the big lorries. Um, so there, there's more hazard involved in that department than most others. Uh, the lights themselves also get very hot, uh, which is a key risk that needs to be considered. Uh, especially at the end of the day when you know the, the lights will have been left on until the last shot was done um, and then they'll be in a hurry to get, get gone just like everybody else will. Now uh, the other reason we want to make friends with them is because if we want to plug our laptop in or our mobile phone in, um, especially if we're not in a studio, um, it will be the lighting and electrical department that will magically um, make an extension lead appear at our workstation. Um, it also means if we want to plug anything in anywhere, it's common courtesy to speak to a spark um, and say, you know, it's all right if I charge my phone here. Politeness, manners, asking up front goes a very long way. Um, and then the reason being they know, you know, they've calculated how much is on every circuit. They know whether a circuit can take it. You might think it's just your laptop, but actually they might realise that, hang on, no, I've already got both the DIT charges on here. I don't want to risk it. Um, or they might go, oh, actually, no, because that's on a generator. But if you want to charge your phone if you go over here this is this is mains power it's in the build and it's fine to use this one um so they're really good uh, make friends with them um, they will solve little problems um also if um where you, you've been asked to set up doesn't have light um ask them and uh, light shall appear quite often uh they like to think of themselves as perhaps the most important um department uh, on set um that can be argued uh, but the camera department quite clearly have an important role to play. Um, so your camera department is headed up by uh, DOP or Director of Photography. Um, so actually the DOP is the head of the camera and the lighting departments. Um, they, are, they are overseeing everything. They are looking at how to create a shot, how to make it visually appear the way it visually appears on, on a piece of film or these days on a digital sensor. Um, Below them, uh, your next most senior will be the camera operator. Below them is the first assistant camera, or also known as the focus puller. You've then got your second assistant camera, and then below that, you've got your camera trainees. Um, camera trainees are the ones who run around with compressed air and the, the boards. Uh, your camera trainee could also be known as the clapper loader. They're the ones who will have the sharpie and they'll be writing things on the clapper. Um, Following on from that, you've got your sound department. Uh, so your sound department, um, they're basically looking after everybody getting mic'd up, holding booms. Um, in terms of, you know, risks, uh, the sound department I often consider to be the cause of my risks. Um, they are the ones who are leaning over everybody uh, with a heavy object above their heads. Um, so in terms of sound, I do like to keep an eye on them. If, if I notice them getting a little bit wobbly, um, once uh, there's a little break in filming, I'll go and have a chat with them, make sure they get a bit of glucose, make sure they get themselves hydrated, um, because if they're starting to get the shakes early in the day, by the end of the day, that mic's probably ended up on somebody's head and uh, we're, we're treating two casualties, the, the one who's exhausted and dehydrated and caused the problem, and the one who's now presenting with a head injury. Um, neither is a particularly good situation, especially when you consider the one with a head injury is likely to be a member of the cast. Uh, you've then got your arts, your props, and your set deck teams. Um, so art department is kind of all-encompassing. Uh, props is shorthand for properties. 
So these could be things that are owned by the production company or the studio, or they could be things that are being hired in from a specialist prop hire um, company. Um, at ProMed, we do um, offer medical props to the film and TV industry. So we do get inquiries every now and again going, you know, do you have a data that we can use? Do you have a stretcher that we can use? Um, we're looking to, um, you know, do some shots in the back of an ambulance. Uh, we're going to build the set. Um, but do you have bandages and then the oxygen and the things that would need to be in there? Um, you know, we might be asked um, for any number of things. Uh, I can remember working on a feature film a few years ago and they were creating um, an interior of a hospital room. And one of the things they wanted to have in their fridge in there was um, some blood products. Um, so they had some out of date bags of saline and they had some red um, pigment dye, um, which was liquefied. Uh, looked really good, um, except uh, they were using a, uh, it was either a two mil or a five mil syringe, and uh, they were probably trying to use a 22 gauge needle um, to kind of draw up um, and inject this pigment. Um, this was quite late at night. Uh, we all wanted to go home. Um, we were overrunning. It was mainly in a filming. Um, so unsurprisingly, we were overrunning. Um, I kind of looked at it and I went, uh, he seemed to be making a meal out of this. I'm like, well, this is what we're being given. Like, do you know a better way to do it? I went, well, what are you actually trying to do? And they told me. And I went, yeah, yeah, let me, let me go and get my bag. And uh, I grabbed a couple of 20 mil syringes. Uh, a couple of 14 gauge needles <laughs> when trying with these and demonstrated just how much easier it was. And, you know, in the time it took them to do one bag, I think I'd done four on my own. Um, so they then decided to uh, use my method. Um, and did I really care about the fact that I'd probably spent a couple of quid on, you know, in date parts for the bar? I wasn't really that bothered. Um, I probably got to bed an hour earlier by doing that. Um, for the rest of for the rest of that, um, if uh, if there was a break, they would always come back and give me a can of coke. It's the simple little things that made me smile um, because I helped them out. Um, and set deck that's shorthand for set decoration. Um, so then people that are basically placing the things on the set, making it look good. Uh, if you see the role of stagehand, stagehand falls within that overall department. Uh, they're the people that carry the things between the cages, the sort of cage being where they keep the high value properties. Um, and the, the set itself, um, they will work to the direction of like an art director or property master um, or a set decorator. Another department, another high risk department as far as we're concerned is rigging. Um, so rigging, you can get um, rigging support, um, a lot of departments. So you might have an electrical rigger, you might have a lighting rigger, you might have a greens rigger, you might have a construction rigger. Uh, but rigging is basically the suspending of objects uh, from anchor points. Um, so they'll be the people who, who uh, build scaffold or climb scaffold, um, will have some points and some ceilings, or they will uh, create some points on their own scaffold and structures, uh, and they will suspend things. Uh, so that could be lights. That could be greens. So greens refer to a green felt material, which creates a, a green screen, um, of which can then be replaced uh, in editorial with um, another background. Um, they'll be responsible for that along with a greensman. So a greensman is the person responsible for keeping the, the green felt to be completely clean and clear of dust, making sure it's hung correctly, that there's no creases in it, that all the folds are in the correct Way that all the Velcro pieces are, are in, you know, it has to be perfect. So there is one person whose job that is. Uh, but you know, they'll be supported by a rigger who, who hangs out in the first place. Um, riggers get paid quite a lot of money. Um, they, they are generally retained throughout the entire shoot um, because if things need to be adjusted, they'll be the ones who um, would, would attend to that need. Uh, but again, it's a high risk department because not only is there things that work in a height involved and lifting equipment, uh, but also they are suspending things overhead. So obviously if they drop something, um, then that could cause cause injury. So it's, uh, it's you know quite good to be wise to that. And the one thing I forgot to mention is that the lightning electrical department is headed up by somebody called a gaffer. So a gaffer is, um, if you're from the northeast of England, you'll know that a gaffer is the boss. 
Um, so your gaffer um, is the person in charge of lighting and electrical. Uh, depending on, on the way filming's gone, they tend to be one of the more stressed looking ones towards the end of the day. So I know all that while I was talking there, I did try and explain any of the specific words that I was using, um, but let's look a little bit more at some of the kind of film and, and TV terminology that you're going to come across. So call, right, so call is the time that you must be on set ready to work. So you will get a call sheet. So a call sheet is a document issued every day. Um, I'm really hoping one of my admin team is looking at the three call sheets that we uh, have on the go for the three jobs that we're on tomorrow. Um, and making sure everybody knows what time they need to be where and who their contacts are and what the order of filming is, uh, what the weather is going to be like, where our nearest hospitals are, what radio channels we should be using, um, how many people are on set, uh, who's in charge of COVID, uh, because all of that information is found on the call sheet. Uh, so the call sheet will, will tell you the day, um, the times that you're on set, it'll tell you the sunrise, the sunset times if you're outdoors, it will tell you what scenes you are shooting, whether they are daytime or nighttime scenes, it will have the full address of every location that you're working on, it will have a full list of everybody who is due to be working on set that day and contact details for them, um, it will tell you what time breaks are going to be taken, um, it, it is basically your, your one document that you do not want to be without when you're on a film and TV set is the one reference document that should answer about 95% of your questions. Now things to watch out for, especially as a medic, is the word pre-call. So you will often see um, departments um, with a pre-call time. So that is quite often the light and electrical department. Um, the hair, makeup and costume departments sometimes get a pre-call if um, there's a lot to do for a um, particular cast or if there's a lot of cast to get through, um, then they'll often be pre-called. Um, if there are particular stunts or special effects, then stunts and effects might be pre-called so that they can come on early and get everything tested and ready before the rest of the crew arrive. Um, and usually what you'll find is, with the exception of hair, makeup, um, costume or the glam department and never ever ever call them the glam departments if you want to make friends with them. Uh, they hate being called the glam squad or the glam team. Um, but yes, the glam departments, um, with that as an exception, if anybody else is being pre-called, there's about a 99% chance that the medic is being pre-called. If the medic hasn't been pre-called and I see the lights of electrical, or rigging or SFX working, I will usually put in a call to PM and go, you've got them working at seven, but we're not called till nine. And then they'll go, oh shit, yeah. Can you guys turn up to seven as well? Yeah, of course we can. Um, but we just need that conversation. We need that on records so when we invoice them, they, they understand why, why we did that. Um, everything gets run by the PM before it happens. Uh, otherwise you don't get paid for it. Um, so just check your pre-calls. If you think you should be on pre-call and you're not, have that conversation early. Um, if you read the pre-calls and, and you're not there and you're happy you're not there, that's great. Um, don't make the mistake of just looking at crew call because if you're not there when everybody else is ready to start work, uh, especially as you're going to be the person taking temperatures these days, uh, nobody else can start work until you're there, uh, it's, it's not good. Um, and it is the time that you are on set ready to work. So that means you have cleared security, you have parked your car, you have walked to set with the necessary equipment. Um, if you've worked in some of the major studios, uh, if anybody has been to WBSL, and I'm not going to be any more specific than that, but if anybody's been to WBSL, uh, day one when you are there, you need to allow 45 minutes to clear security um, because you will um, have to go in and join a queue, um, they will want to see your ID, they will check the list for the production you're on, they will issue you with a smart card, they will activate it for certain stages and the barrier and certain car parks, they will go and look at your vehicle, they will write down your reg and give you a vehicle sticker and add you to the AMPR system. Um, and if there's a few people starting that morning, it can easily be 45 minutes um, just to clear security. And if you're on L stage, uh, there's another 
five, six minute drive when you obey the 10 mile an hour speed limit and all the speed bumps. Um, some of us may have uh, not obeyed that on the runway. Um, it is literally a runway. Um, but you know, you've, you've got to allow another five, six minutes to get to your stage. And again, if it's day one and you don't know where you're going, but you're thinking you're going to need your kit out, especially if you need to do temperature checks, then you might want to allow 10, 15 minutes because depending on where you're told to park and depending on where in the stage you're setting up, you might not necessarily have access to that door, so you're humping your gear. So, you know, day one um, on a multi day job in a studio, I would always aim to be there an hour before. Um, I'd rather be there an hour before, get in within five minutes, and have a half hour snooze in my car than get there 15 minutes before and still be stood in the security office getting a phone call from an irate production manager. Um, so make sure you think about all these things. Uh, if you don't know, if you've not been there before, ask the production manager to just say, you know, I'm sorry, I've not worked in this studio before. Um, is there any security processes that, that's going to happen in the morning? Do I need to get there a bit early to, to get registered? You know, if you're shown proactive, if you're shown willing, then at least worst case, if you are a little bit late, um, at least they know you did try because you asked the questions you showed willing in the first place. Uh, so the first place you'll present if, you know, whether you are going to a location, whether you're working on, on an established um, major studio, or whether you're on a small studio, first, first place you're going to turn up to is the unit base. So the unit base is where all, all departments are based from. It's not necessarily next to where the film's being shot. So this is where all of the trailers turn up to. So your trailers can be, you know, your hair, your makeup, your costume, uh, your artist dressing rooms, um, craft, which I'm going to come on to shortly, um, your production office or your mobile production office, your honey wagons, which I'll come on to shortly. Um, they, they will all be parked in a particular arrangement and it'll be organised. The, the unit production manager will decide how they've been parked. Um, and, and the location manager have decided which piece of land they're going to be parked on. You know, there's a lot of conversations happened. A lot of people's jobs are involved with, you know, how unit base comes into life. Um, and, and this is where everybody turns up to. So this is where you will go and collect your walkie talkie from, uh, or your walkie or your radio, and your different film sets use different words there. Um, but this is where you'll collect that from. That's usually the production office. It's where you'll find the production manager and say, hello, where do you want me? It's where you'll get breakfast from in the morning if, if breakfast is part of your catering deal. Um, it may not necessarily be next to where the film is being shot. Um, off the top of my head, I think the furthest I've been uh, a unit base to a shooting location has been two mile. Um, the, the nearest is obviously your, your stages um, on, on your big studios um, where they are literally outside the roller shutter doors. Um, but uh, there is always somewhere defined as a unit base. Um, check your call sheet. Make sure you turn up to the right place in the morning. Don't go straight to location for half past six in the morning and wonder why nobody's there and you can't get through the locked gates um, and why you're getting a phone call going, where are you? I have a queue of 50 people waiting to have their temperature taken who are all hungry and they can't be served breakfast yet. Um, you know, if there's multiple addresses, the, the one you care about is the one that says unit base, because actually, once you've got the unit base, there is usually a lot of nice fluorescent, you know, yellow, orange, pink, green, whatever colour they're using, signs um, that will basically, uh, they will say lock um, initially. So lock is location. You then have crew and tech. So medics generally follow tech. So tech means technical vehicles. So the camera, the lighting, um, the big things that absolutely must, must, must be as close as possible to where filming is. Medic tends to get away with being classed as a tech vehicle because of where vehicle based, all our kits in our vehicle, and it is much better for, her, for us to have everything right there than a 10 minute walk away where the rest of the crew is parked. Because if we suddenly discover that, well, actually, you know, that traction split might be useful because they've kind of fallen off that, that, that platform and you know, might have a fractured femur. You just wait there, and I'm just going to walk 10 minutes to go and get the female split. 10 minutes back, oh, look, the ambulances. Yeah, I look like a knob. No, you know, sometimes um, certain production managers or certain location managers may forget that medics need that. Um, so, a little casual conversation, very similar to what I've just described, tends to remind them of why it's important that our vehicle is located uh, next to us. 
Um, one thing we found uh, with our regular clients here at ProMed is our regular producers and PMs um, just know, you know, we've had that conversation once, we've explained it. Um, you know, they're now in the habit of, they book us and go, when you find out you're medic, will you remember to give us the car reg? Yeah, sure. Um, you build up that relationship, they get to know you, and, and they will be quite proactive in that. Um, so yeah, make sure you talk to unit race. So next thing is on camera. So sometimes in your call sheet, you will see the, um, the words on camera next to a time. Sometimes it will be within the schedule, uh, maybe marked as take whatever, scene whatever. But it is the first defined point when we are going to have the cast on the set, you're going to have all the departments in position so that we can record the first take. Um, so everybody needs to be ready. So it may be that your call time is nine o'clock, your on camera time is 10 o'clock. You might look at it and think, Do you know what, there, there isn't really enough time to get through everybody. Uh, and I think hair and makeup are probably going to turn a little bit early. And we get there at half eight. Because actually, if you're still doing temperature checks and typing up your documentation, your first assistant director is going to be a little bit annoyed that you're still tapping away on your keyboard when they're expecting absent silence. So you've got rolling, uh, turning and at speed. So what the, the sequence of events is everybody does everything they need to do. The camera gets built, the lights get turned on, the cast get their hair, make a costume done, they get brought to set, and then you'll hear various words. Now these words tend to be called initially from the first AD, or they are then going to be repeated by the runners, depending on how big your production is, how many radio channels there are, um, whether people are within earshot of the first AD. Um, so you will generally hear quiet please, or quiet on set, or quiet and still, and they will then give the command turnover. Uh, that'll then be responded, first of all, it should come from sound, if there's sound, and they will say sound speed, or sound rolling, um, sound at speed, speed, something like that, which means they press the button and they're happy that their equipment is now recording. You will then hear turning or rolling um, or camera speed or camera at speed from the either the camera operator or the first assistant camera. And that's confirming the same thing, that they're happy that they press the record button and that their camera is functioning and everything is being recorded from that moment onwards. At that point, shut your mouth. There is one word you are allowed to say from this moment onwards, and you are only allowed to say it if a member of the cast is in grave danger. That word is cut, and the only time a non-director can say that is when the member of the cast is in grave danger. Other than that, plant your feet on the ground. Um, try and breathe slowly and quietly. Um, open your mouth so you're not making a noise when you're breathing. and just remain where you are. It doesn't matter if you are walking across the set, it doesn't matter if you were getting something from your car and your boots open, it doesn't matter if you're on a sofa, it doesn't matter what you're doing, until you hear the word cut, shut up, stand still, don't do nothing. Um, if you do and you're called out on it, you're gonna have really annoyed someone, to put it politely. Um, you might also hear turnover be said by the first AD. That's just their command to, to start the recording. And then you'll hear cut. So cut is always said by a director. And that means that the camera and sound are stopping recording. You will usually hear some kind of acknowledgement from both of those um, when they have actually pressed their buttons and have confirmed that that indeed it has stopped recording. Uh, however, if you suddenly hear a camera trainee or clap a load out, shout end boards, uh, that is usually because they forgot to do it at the beginning of the take and they, they must do it before they stop recording or the editorial department, the post-production team are going to get rather annoyed. And it means generally, as far as you're concerned, stay still, don't move and shut up for another 30 seconds because they're going to go up there with the clapper. It's rather than hold the clapper this way and clap from the top, they're going to hold the clapper this way and clap from the bottom, which makes obvious which end of the clip it's at. Uh, when you've heard that go, give it a few more seconds, and that's the point when you can start moving and talking again. 
Now, all going well, you shouldn't hear rank boards because it should be done at the beginning. But, you know, just, just be wary. You'll tend to get an instinct within the first two hours of filming. You will tend to, to get to know whether the, cam, the camera loader and the camera training is actually switched on or whether they're a little bit green and it might be their first day on set and, and hasn't quite picked up the rhythm of how things are supposed to go yet. Um, if they've done it a couple of times in the morning, yeah, just just get yourself used to it. Um, other, than, other than that, if you haven't heard it, then it's going to be a very infrequent call because everybody's switched on and actually knows what they're doing. Uh, if you hear hold the work or stop the work, that's because you've got an annoyed assistant director because somebody made a noise, moved, affected the light or did something while the cameras were rolling and they now need to do that take again. Um, if you hear that a second time in a take, um, then there's going to be a lot of very, very annoyed people. Um, so don't be that person. Um, generally speaking, what I tend to do is if I hear that and I'm stood up, I will go and very quickly find somewhere to perch myself um, because um, I'm just going to resign myself to the fact that we might be there for a little while longer. If somebody says something is locked off or it's a lock off, what it means is the set, the camera positions um, need to be left untouched. It might be that they're, they're leaving something, they're filming it over a longer period of time. It might be that they have done some filming on it in the morning and they're going to come back to it later in the afternoon. Um, quite often over lunch if they've got something set up and then they break for lunch and then they come back they don't want to have to, to redo everything that they've done so it'll be it'll be a locked off set um, I tend to stay away from them uh, usually they're very kind and marked with tape on the floor uh, and I just stay away from them uh, not my business what goes on on the set and if, if it's locked off there's generally nobody on it so I don't need to be near it uh, my favorite word is wrap um, and that means it is the end of filming for a day. So your call sheet will have an estimated camera wrap. Um, you may also hear wrap being referred to in terms of a person or a department or indeed yourself. So right, can we, you know, right, that's the cast wrapped. Um, right, cast are, cast are leaving, we can wrap hair and makeup um, or wrap costume. Um, right, okay, majority of people have gone, let's wrap the medic. Um, you know, can refer to individuals being told to go home, and that'll be the time you're paid until. Um, it can be um, the end of the overall shoot, so a feature film. Um, you will hear that's a wrap, um, or you know, that's the so and so wrapped. Um, and then that basically means it's all done. Uh, you also have wrap parties. So if you've been on a production for a several weeks or months, um, you may, perhaps not in COVID, but you may have a wrap party. Um, usually involves uh, beers, care of production. Uh, just be wary uh, if you're on set for several weeks um, and you know it's the last day on camera. Uh, it may be a wise idea um, either not to drive or to leave your vehicle somewhere you can access it the following day, um, if, especially if you're going to have more than one um, or if you're going to go out that night. Um, especially the longer films, they do certainly used to tended to go out and have a prop party of it. Um, so I would always make sure I was still around for a couple of days after because I wouldn't want to drive the next day. Um, next one at the end of the day you'll hear is day rig. So this is the time following wrap when everybody packs away. Usually films tend to say about an hour, um, depending on how complex it is. I've been on jobs where that's taken two or three hours. Um, so check the call sheet if it doesn't have a day rig time. Um, I wouldn't necessarily ask the PM, I would look at the big departments, so who have I seen in the morning with a load of big kit, and I'll go and chat to their department heads, so quite often I'll have a little chat with a gaffer, any riggers, um, usually just those departments to be fair are the ones that tend to be bothered about maybe properties in the art department if there's a lot of them, and I'll just say, um, you know, what, what do you think your D-rig time is going to be tonight, um, what are you doing heavy lifting, yeah, cool, I'll stick around until, until I know you've gone. Uh, they'll be happy that they know that you're staying for them um, and you just kind of have gauged how long you're going to be. Now, if that's going to take you over your 12-hour day, that's the point where you're going to have a little chat with the PM and say, um, am I wrapping it 12 hours or do you want me to stay while these departments are still at work? Again, production managers are much prefer to have that conversation over lunch 
then have that conversation at RAP when, when it's been a bit of a problem because they can have that conversation with people controlling the money earlier on in the day and chances are you'll be told, yeah, it's fine to stay, I've authorised it. Um, or so and so, the, P the producer or whoever has authorised it. Make a note of who authorises it. You sort of include that on your invoice to make sure you get paid on time. You might also hear the word tail lights or hard outs. They, they mean the same thing. And that's basically the time at which everybody has to be off site. So um, quite often with locations, it's referred to as a hard out. Uh, with studios, it tends to be referred to as tail lights. Um, so quite often on, on schedules, um, I see the word, you know, hard out 1900. Uh, that could be because the venue is then reverting back to being its normal bar, restaurant, museum, you know, whatever it happens to be. Uh, taillights is studio, and basically, you know, that is the time the, the studio owner wants to see the taillights of all the vehicles driving out of his gate uh, because he wants to lock up and go to bed. Um, so it's a time when everybody needs to be off site. Um, the other piece of terminology that you might uh, want to know is a 10 1. Um, so a 10 1 means uh, answering to the call of nature, um, visiting the restroom. Uh, not available on comms whilst you're washing your hands, powdering your nose, or whatever other euphemism you want. Um, you tend not to announce 10 1, but if uh, if you're being radioed, uh, somebody might go, Oh, I think they're 10 1. Or if you're radioing somebody and goes, Yeah, they're 10 1, then now you know where they are. Um, you, there is also a 10 2, it's, it's used uh, a lot less frequently, and I don't need to tell you what a 10 2 is. Um, Craft I mentioned earlier, so craft or the craft service, craft services, craft department, they are they are the best people. They supply you with food, snacks and cups of tea, coffee, water throughout the day. Um, so craft services is basically the table, the tent or the vehicle, uh, which has got, you know, the crisps, the sweets, the fruit, uh, the million and one herbal tea bags, depending on the size of your film and, and the desires of your cast. Um, but they're they're quite a quite a nice um, team. Um, I you know, COVID aside, it's where I used to tend to set up if I was given my own gazebo. I tended to ask for it to be next to craft um, because that made me very visible. It meant everybody knew where I was because everybody always found out where the craft tent was. So if they could just remember that the medic is next to the craft tent, they don't need to remember where I am specifically. Uh, it also meant I got to see everybody quite regularly and then you know offer them a little complimentary health check. Um, you know, if I saw someone, you know, you know, yeah, okay, I can see you having a bit of sugar, you're feeling a bit shit, I'm like, yeah, do you want to grab yourself a couple of bottles of water as well because you're looking a little bit thirsty and you probably need a drink. Um, you know, you're there to look after their well-being. You're not just there to respond to accidents and incidents. You're there to look after the, the, the crew's health, and that health is physical and mental. It's their well-being. Um, so if you put yourself in a nice position where you're visible, then you're doing your job well. Uh, so radio communications, um, so you'll go and collect your, your walkie, your radio, your whatever they want to call it, device that enables two-way communication wirelessly. Um, so there might be a dedicated channel for medics. Um, if there is, you might also find the HNS tend to loiter on there because they like to be out of the way of general chit chat as well. Uh, but if not, then there's a couple of rules of thumb. So if you're a unit medic, if it is main, if it is unit filming, so if there is actual active filming going on, then medics tend to follow the same channel that the ADs. ADs are assistant directors. So whatever channel they tend to loiter on, that's the channel that the medic is usually best placed on. So that can be the same channel as camera if it's a smaller job. Larger jobs, the ADs and the runners tend to have their own little shared channel, and that's where medics tend to just need to listen out because at least then you'll know when the camera's turning over, when it's cut, um, and if anything's stopped for any reason, that's the first radio channel it's going to be called on. If you're there on construction, so if there's no kind of unit work taking place, the best channel to loiter on, unless you're told otherwise, would be locations because if there's anything taking place, there is bound to be a locations manager there because you can't be somewhere if you're not on a location. That, that's a definition. Um, so there is a locations manager. So 
generally speaking, the medic tends to follow the location manager as far as radio channel uh, loitering goes, um, because it's usually the location manager who knows where the medic is, and people know the location manager for anything. Uh, radios tend to be on silent mode by default, so in the medical world, we're very used to turning our radio on and it's beeping and making a noise. Um, especially digital nowadays, we press the push to talk, and we're used to hearing a beep, letting us know that it's safe to talk. Some radios will will beep at the end of a conversation. Um, so if you're used to that, um, be aware they don't do that in film. In film world, unless they're asked otherwise, radios are supplied in silent mode. So when you turn it on, quite often you won't hear a beep. Uh, you might just see the screen. Uh, some of them even have their screens disabled because it's an additional light source they don't want. Um, if you change channel, it's generally done silently. If you press and push to talk, even if it's on a digital mode, you, you'll not hear anything. Um, so just, just be aware uh, when you turn it on, you're watching for the light. When you're transmitting, you're watching for the light, those kind of things. Um, earpieces are pretty much mandatory, certainly if you're within um, audible range of, of the set and it's a sound um, recording, then you, you know you must wear your earpiece and it needs to be at the lowest volume that you can just about hear it. Um, but that, you know, if I'm stood next to you, show that I show that I shouldn't be able to hear from your earpiece through my ear. Um, because obviously camera, um, film and TV world microphones are ultra sensitive. Um, very different to any other kind of training medics have had. There are no formal uh, protocols on radio communications other than once you have heard the words turnover, uh, raw camera or anything like that, uh, you do not say anything on a radio until somebody calls the word cut. Um, you just don't do it. Um, other than that, yeah, it's, there's no formal protocols. Uh, listen out, you, you will be requested by any number of means. Medic, unit medic, it might be your name, uh, it might be your first aid. Um, it, you might just hear yeah, someone's injured themselves, can we have some help? Then there's no protocol. Um, I do tend to, you know, when I'm talking to people, um, especially if we're involved in the start of their briefings or we get the chance to have a little chat with the AD in the morning, uh, then we'll see, and if you want us on radio, be clear and shout for medic. We will respond to medic. Um, if you say anything else and we don't respond, say the word medic and we will because very little of the radio traffic concerns us. Uh, so it's very easy for us to kind of have it on but not actually listen to what's being said. I'm sure we've all been there on, on, on busy radio channels before. So what's expected of us? Um, so we're expected to know everybody. Um, now, these days, that's actually not too difficult. Um, they're keeping cast and crew to an absolute minimum at the moment. Uh, same with clients being on set. Uh, so knowing everybody is very easy. But it didn't used to be. Um, so certainly know your HODs. Certainly get to know the people who've got medical conditions. Certainly get to know the people who, you know, are a bit of a welfare concern for you, who you're going to have to talk to. Um, and know who the PAs are for all of the cast. So if, you, if you're working with high profile cast, you will generally find on the call sheet, uh, it says PA to so-and-so. They're your godsends. If you need to interact with cast, they're your godsends. Um, if you've got concerns about cast, they're your godsends. Um, so just keep your eye um, on, on who they are, get to know them by name. Um, I remember a few years ago uh, working on uh, a shoot involving water, and I won't name them, but uh, the cast member concerned um, wasn't particularly thrilled at listening to a safety briefing. Um, the, the dive team may as well have been talking to the swimming pool for, for the amount of uh, response they got from this, this particular person on cast. The, uh, the much more qualified medical person than me tried to have a similar conversation. And again, the swimming pool gave a far better recollection of that conversation. Um, I then had a direct conversation with the PA, which, which was to the effect of, you know, I know you're being really helpful, so and so, and, and I know that you're basically doing what she says, so and so. Um, I've seen you've been doing a great job with her. But now is the point where you need to tell her that she's going to listen. And if she ain't going to listen to you, then um, and there's going to be a bit of a big problem and there's going to be a rather annoyed director very soon. Uh, and, and because I've got the rapport with the 
personal assistant to that cast member, um, that that PA did go and speak to that cast member, and the cast member then came out and spoke to me uh, because I had the brass neck to basically tell her that she had to listen, but I did it in the right way. Um, and then I basically then recollected the previous two conversations I've been part to, uh, and she responded and gave me a good summary of what I'd said. And, and the dive team and the person I was working with overheard that and, and were then happy. Um, sometimes knowing everybody and knowing everybody's name and, you know, generally being that friendly person allows you to kind of broker some conversations that, that you know, other people might not. Um, be visible. So you need to be visible. So people need to know where you are. They need to know how to find you. Um, they need to see you. But stay hidden. So, you know, well away from the camera line, uh, well away from Video Village. Video Village is full of everybody who doesn't need to be there watching the screens. We certainly don't need to be there. Don't get me wrong, if, if a PM says, do you want to come and have a look at what's going on? Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're invited, do what you're invited to do. But if you're not invited, stay away from the activity, you know, Make sure people doing the activity can see you, but make sure you're you're well away from them. You, you're respecting the fact that that is their work area, and you are just a, a, a guest in their work area if you're in the way, basically. Now I've just seen a million and one um, questions come up. So, um, Jenny Goldsmith, does the production manager provide radios, earpieces, and industry standard equipment to be used? So. The PM will arrange all radios um, and earpieces. Uh, runners will be tasked with providing radios to everybody, providing spare fully charged batteries, providing earpieces, sanitizing them, showing people how they work if they're unfamiliar. Uh, these days, I would say your two most common radios in film and TV world are your Motorola GP series and your Motorola DP3 series, it's still the three series they're using. Um, they are separate earpieces, they are multi-pin connectors. Uh, what I tend to recommend is I will personally, um, I carry high rose earpieces. Uh, so there's a system called high rose and it's a six pin connector. And then I carry a high rose adapter for all the common types of radio. So Motorola M series, um, M1 connector, the GP connector, the DP connector, uh, the High Terra H1 connector, which is the multi-pin connector for High Terra. I've also got a Kenwood and an Icom in my bag, uh, digital and two-pin. And that way I'm using my own earpiece. Um, I don't, you know, it's not that I don't trust the runners. I've seen them sanitize the equipment. They do an excellent job of that every day. And on, on multi-day shoots, you are expected to, you know, keep your earpiece in a labeled bag and you just get given the bag and you take your own earpiece out and stuff. There's some good protocols around that. Um, but I prefer my own. I've bought my own earpieces, very expensive earpieces, because I like the comfort of how it fits on my ear. Um, so if you want to do that, I recommend you go down the high rose route because then you just need to buy the different connectors. Um, don't ask the PM what radios they're going to get. Uh, they don't know. They, they just know they own radios and they turn up. Um, regular runners who are used to working on certain productions and know certain production companies probably would know um, because they, they'll handle them all the time. But generally speaking, most people don't. Um, so just get, get a hold of them. Um, Nathan, what's the etiquette around riggers? Kindly asking for a hand. Do we refuse on the grounds of limited remit insurance or could it be a way of building rapport? Um, so it, it very much depends um, on what they're asking for. Um, will I go off the ground? No, I won't. Um, will I foot a ladder for somebody? Yeah, yeah, I will. Um, Will I pass them something as long as they're coming down and all I'm doing is you know, keeping a hold of it or putting it flat on my hand and they are then collecting it? Yeah, I would do that uh, because, you know, they might say, oh, can you go and get me the, the you know, so-and-so lamp, you know, a small lamp, while they're bringing the, um, the scissor lift back down. Yeah, if it says I'm getting out of the cage and, and walking across, I'll have been and got it before they've gone up and down. Ultimately, they know if somebody calls medic, I am literally going to put that piece of equipment on the floor where I am and I'm going to go and attend to 
what my primary job is. Um, it's a good way of building rapport, but it's don't do anything dangerous. Um, so if I'm operating a tail lift, I will only operate a tail lift from the side of a vehicle um, where my feet are parallel with the vehicle and I'm not going to go anywhere near the tail lift. Um, you know, quite often I will operate a tail lift for somebody, but I will always do it, you know, with my feet parallel with the vehicle away from the area of operation of the tail lift, and I will just stand at the side and do it. Um, I, would, I wouldn't be on the tail lift, I wouldn't be in the vehicle. Um, I, I need to be in a position where I can immediately go and attend to something else and where I can't become injured myself, basically. Um, so yeah, I mean, build rapport by all means, um, but I tend to say the line is, I can't do anything that could cause injury to me or anybody else, and I can't do anything that I can't immediately walk away from. What's the worst case? If I'm operating a tail lift, I let go of the button, the tail lift stops moving, somebody else has to move their fingers to find me or lean over and reach the switch. It's cost them a few seconds. So, you know, but I wouldn't go climbing on scaffold unless there was a casualty. Um, you know, that that's kind of the difference there. Um, so yeah, always make sure you can immediately respond, always make sure you can walk away from it, and always make sure that you know, whatever you're doing isn't going to cause injury or cause injury to yourself. Um, and it, it does build rapport. Um, you know, it's not going to be the gaffer who's booking the next medic, but actually, if the gaffer's involved in pre-production and people are going, right, we need this, we need that, um, you know, the conversation will go, yeah, we need to get medics, that gaffer might be, oh yeah, who do we have on that last, who do we have on that last job? They were great, I really liked them. Um, you know, they, they helped me at the end of the show. Um, you know, or they helped me in the morning to get, you know, camera. I, I will quite happily push magliners for camera, you know, not on my own, I will push the other end of the magliner whilst the camera operator or the first AC has the business end. Um, but I will quite happily help them push up a hill because, you know, it's a great way of getting on the camera department. If it's a bit dark when they're setting up, I, I always have a torch in my car. Um, I will quite happily shine a torch on it over them um, and give them a bit extra light um, because it, it works no end of, of help and, you know, they remember you. Um, they don't remember your company, they don't remember the guy who put plaster on somebody who cut the finger, they don't remember the person who told you to have a drink when you were looking a bit pasty, they remember the, the guy you stayed until every single person was offset and they shone a light over everybody packing up cases in the dark. They weren't afraid to, you know, carry the apple carts or the apple boxes to the back of the truck for somebody. You know, simple little things, you know, a little bit of lifting and carrying, you know, we're all manual hands and trained, we all carry our own kit bags. You know, some departments have got more kit than others. I will always offer to help somebody um, because that's why ProMed gets invited back because we have staff who, who muck in. We are team players, you know, at the end of the day, everybody is there for the same reason. Everybody is there to produce good quality footage that can be edited and used for the, commercial, the music video, or the feature film, whatever it might be. And then at the end of the day, everybody wants to go home healthy and uninjured to their loved ones or, you know, whatever it is they do on an evening. Um, and if we can, you know, help out in a little bit of a way, if we can, you know, move a few boxes for people, if we can shine a light for somebody, foot a ladder, whatever it is, yeah, more than happy to do that. Um, and, you know, people request ProMed or people have requested me by name before because I've, I've helped out, you know. Um, I've, you know, back in the day when data on phones wasn't really a thing, tethering wasn't really a thing, I would quite happily share the Wi-Fi connection I brought with health and safety and locations, you know. They weren't obviously streaming videos, you know, they weren't watching hours and prime on my connection. They were sending emails, they were reading documents, they, they, they were quickly looking up, you know, Google Maps satellite view of what their next location looked like. It wasn't a huge impact on my data, but you know, they didn't have it, I did. Um, and then it meant when I ran out of PCRs and I needed to print something, do you mind if I use your printer? Yeah, help yourself, print as much as you want. Because I'd, I'd, you know, I'd done something first for them, I'd shown myself as willing. So when I wanted something in return, 
it, you know, it was like, yeah, of course you can. Um, it, it's a two-way thing. You know, you help somebody, they'll help you. Uh, Jenny, our uh, medics told in advance about people with pre-existing conditions that we need to watch out for. So sometimes it'll be highlighted in a risk assessment. So if it affects the job, if it affects the shoot, you might find it in a risk assessment, um, but often not. Um, and it's on those longer jobs. This is where getting to know everybody goes, you know. Um, you know, yeah, if you want a free health check, if you want us to do your blood pressure, if you want us to check your blood glucose, you know, happy to screen you for little things, happy to do some observations, make sure you're all fit and healthy, say, you know, I know it takes, you know, you want to see your GP about a minor niggle, but if you want, want me to have a little check over, you know, have a little chat, um, you know, sometimes people will come up to you as well and, and go, oh, yeah, just to let you know, you blah, blah. Um, I also tend to ask for longer jobs, PMs, you know, because they'll be asking about diet needs. I'll go, well, you just ask general allergies. And, and then I'll know if anybody's got general allergies as well, and you know, just keep an eye out, um, especially in relation to food there. Uh, Daniel, our medics here are also providing screening role, um, temperature screening due to clinical experience. I'm going to come on to that. Um, Chris, um, confidentiality agreement in place, especially regarding cast. So, film and TV world, there's way, way more than a confidentiality agreement. Um, Non-disclosure agreements are very, very commonplace, which basically means anything you learn about anything, anyone, any location, any piece of equipment, it doesn't matter what it is, if you learn about anything within the, the remit of you being part of that production, you may not speak about it, photograph it, tweet about it, Facebook about it, otherwise create any impression to anybody else, no matter who they are, where they are, by any means, even telepathy, that you were involved in this production and know anything because of this production. Um, I think the Official Secrets Act is um, slightly leaner than, um, than, than a film non-disclosure agreement from um, a certain big American uh, company uh, with some searchlights and uh, um, a big golden number. I'm not naming any organisations that I may or may not have worked for or that I may or may not have encountered non-disclosure agreements for because obviously I cannot discuss whether I have or haven't worked for them or have or haven't signed any non-disclosure agreements in order to potentially work or not work for such organisations. But I think we all know which great big American uh, organisation uh, involved in filming that I'm on about, especially if you've been in it. Um, yeah, their non-disclosure agreement is, is way tighter than the Official Secrets Act. Um, way tighter. Um, you, you literally cannot talk about anything. You know, you were never there. The filming never took place. Uh, you never went to that location. You never met any anybody else working on that. Um, yeah, the non-disclosure agreements are typically worded that you weren't there, the film didn't take place, um, <laughs> that the company didn't exist for all, for all intents and purposes. That's the way you got to look at it. Um, generally speaking, as a company owner, I get on quite well with, with my PM clients, and I'll say, do you mind if I grab some photos of some camera shit? Do you mind if I grab a few photos of, of a lightning truck? Do you mind if I grab some photos? Uh, a video village when when the screens are disconnected, and they'll go yeah, just make sure the one from casts in it, um, because they know I just need a little bit of publicity for us. But I will never do that without speaking to them, um, because if, if I'm seen taking a photograph, well, what am I taking a photograph of? How am I going to use it? Am I going to be exposing their commercial confidentiality? Well, actually, if I've said what I'm doing, they'll tell me you know when it's the appropriate time to do that, and they'll be very happy with with the fact that I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is exactly that kind of thing. Yeah, your call. Yeah, I have actually seen call sheets must not be left lying around. Call sheets may not be left unattended in vehicles. Call sheets must be shredded or burned at the end of the day. Um, have seriously been lines that I have seen on call sheets. Um, so yes, um, it's difficult to learn about health conditions obviously if you are told about them you are being told about them as a medical professional and therefore the the expectations of medical confidentiality would apply uh lunch um so if you're part of main unit you will uh, be part of main unit catering um which is is usually very 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 nice nosh if you're part of construction bring your own um if you are in lucky positions where you do both, you're mainly the construction medic, but you may occasionally help out with a second or a third unit, and you therefore get your lovely little badge that says you're a unit medic, uh, by all means, take, 
take advantage of that, uh, but do so with the knowledge of the PM. The PM won't care if you tell them. Uh, if you don't tell the PM and they find you in the lunch queue and they go, you're not on my unit today, yeah, I expect a bit of a talent off. But if you go, uh, I'm on construction two stages down, uh, my mind if I pop across for lunch? And they'll go, yeah, why not? Yeah, come and help yourself. Um, ask and you, you will be rewarded. Uh, don't ask and you will never be invited back again. Um, and they'll say, you know, they'll go, you might, they might, if you're lucky, go to your company and, and say, I want a medic, but it can't be them. Uh, what's more realistic is they would never use your company again. Um, so just, just you know, ask, be polite. Um, generally speaking, the way COVID is, we tend to lunch first if we're doing temperature checks at the end of lunch, or we will lunch last if we are um, doing temperature checks first. So your role comes first. So people who you should always let queue jump are the PAs to the cast. Um, anybody, any runners who are um, basically not serving themselves, who are serving directors, first ADs, production and so on, um, I always let them queue jump um, because they're, they're feeding the great and the good and ultimately the people who somewhere along the lines will be paying my bill. Um, other than that, it's kind of every man for themselves, but uh, think about who needs to be available first. So if you're not doing temperature checks and it's a free for all for lunch, I generally let, let uh, the hair, makeup, um, and costume people go in because obviously they need to get the cast dressed before they go back on camera. Um, most of the departments can just kind of rock up and press buttons and be ready to go. Um, so I tend to loiter somewhere in and amongst camera and lighting um, is where I tend to position myself in the lunch queue. Uh, it's just showing respect for the departments that have, you know, those kind of pre-camera work to do, if you will. And now let's look at COVID-19 specifically. So this is going to be answering uh, Daniel's question. So my, my kind of Bible and, and, you know, whether I'm doing advertising or whether I'm doing um, kind of one day work for music videos or whether I'm doing any kind of filming really, I tend to go to the APA. So it's the Advertising Picture Agency, I think off the top of my head. Um, I tend to look at their COVID guidelines. Now, they're currently version 1.6, and the link to their Dropbox folder, where they keep the current edition uh, publicly accessible, is in the references on this slide, um, if you download the slides afterwards when they're emailed out. Um, that's kind of my Bible. It's about a 20-odd page document, and it lists the role of the COVID supervisor. It lists the general mitigations to be taken. It lists how to ensure social distancing is complied with. It talks about cohorts and bubbles. Um, it says what PPE needs to be used and what circumstances. So for me, that's my Bible. It also contains a sample declaration form, uh, which basically says, you know, I hereby declare that I have not had the following symptoms in the last X number of days. I have not tested positive. I do not think I have coronavirus. I will tell production if in the next 14 days I get coronavirus or test positive or have the symptoms. Here are my contact details for test and trace, date, name, sign, address, blah, blah. Um, that's basically what, what, what we created our internal form from, uh, was, was theirs because theirs was good. Theirs is an industry standard guidelines. Um, and it's really good. Now, one of the things that they say is temperature screening. Now, from my perspective as somebody who has a degree in biomedical sciences and is clinically qualified for FREC4 and has best been in, in the industry now for 14 years, temperature screening using infrared forehead thermometers is about as accurate as me getting my scientific calculator and pressing a random number. Um, you know, the difference is the range that you tend to get on an IR thermometer is maybe it's 25 digit, 25 numbers wide, whereas my scientific calculator will give me a thousand numbers wide. But fundamentally, they are both serving the same purpose. They are picking a number out of thin air and displaying it on an LCD. Um, nonetheless, um, it is now an industry standard uh, within the film and TV world. 
um, and it is IR non-contact is absolutely the preference. So you can get some calibrated thermometers. So the ones that you get from Braun and similar manufacturers who specifically advertise IR forehead thermometers, they will have some calibration built into them. Uh, they will have um, usually some distance measuring built in. They will have um, an algorithm um, on their chip that mitigates for certain things. You, you may find they also include an ambient temperature sensor if you take them apart and look at them closely. Um, and then that's because what they're trying to do is they're trying to give you the same value that you would get by putting a contact thermometer on a forehead, which is not the same as the actual radiated temperature. Um, so I have two um, scientifically calibrated IR thermometers that read within sort of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees of each other. Uh, it has a laser in it for distance measuring and I calibrate that by, um, for those of you who do science and can remember GCSEs, I'm also a science teacher, I calibrate that by taking a Leslie cube, sticking a Bunsen burner underneath it, um, filling it full of water, waiting for that water to boil, sticking the thermometer down the middle and making sure it says 100 degrees, and then reading the dark black matte side of the Leslie cube, because uh, black matte emits radiation uh, the most, it absorbs radiation the most. So that is the sign that will give me 100 degrees. So as long as I'm within half a degree on the side of 100, I'm very happy that those thermometers have been, have been you know, reporting accurately. Um, it's very, I'm not going to tell you what the result is if you take a broad thermometer and, and aim it at the black side of a Leslie cube currently being heated full of boiling water. Um, put it this way, it doesn't say 100 degrees. Um, so do have a look. Um, again, you're right, Craig. Um, you're right, Jenny. Some of them uh, will say low. So uh, a human forehead calibrated IR thermometer has an upper and lower range. The scientific thermometers that live in my car um, are accurate. They will give me a negative value. They will give me a three-digit volume. They will give me everything in between. Um, because it is possible to emit thermal radiation below zero degrees Celsius. The ambient temperature is below zero degrees Celsius. Um, IR, I think, unless you have an A level in physics, trying to explain exactly what's going on is a bit difficult. If you do have an A level in physics, um, just search online, you know, infrared. Um, thermal um, or infrared radiation, um, temperature infrared radiation, um, thermal energy transfer, um, IR, those kind of searches will yield the, um, the kind of the, the physics that explain what's going on. Um, so if I have two human beings um, and I have done a tympanic on both ears of both of them and all values are exactly the same and I then do an infrared on both their foreheads. This is not me being racist but the black person will generally have a higher IR temperature because darker colours emit more infrared radiation. Um, whereas somebody who is ginger, hair colour and Caucasian, therefore extremely pale white, will record a lower temperature because bright colours um, emit less radiation. And that is just physics, that is how it works. Um, likewise, red um, emits more than purple. Um, or violet because red is closer to the infrared end of the spectrum whereas purple and violet are closer to the UV end of the visible spectrum. Um, yep, rapid lamp testing create temporary biosecure bubbles. Um, I will come on to that. Um, 
So I tend to do it. Now what I tend to do is the wrist. So I tend to get quite close with the IR, as close as I can get without actually touching. I'll click it as close as I can. Um, the wrist tends to be slightly warmer than the forehead, especially if the forehead's been exposed and people have been wearing sleeves. The wrist tends to be a bit more reflective of, of body temperature. Um, alternatively, I'll tell somebody to go inside, warm up a little bit, and um, I'll do their temperature in a bit. Uh, or alternatively, if they've cycled or run into work, I will you know, tell them, you know, go and get yourself a drink of water and I'll do your temperature in 10 minutes when you sat down. Um, you have to factor these things in. I always carry my tin panic. Um, so if I've got a reading that's concerning me, usually the, the reading above 37.8 is currently the published guidance. Uh, but be aware this does change and certainly be aware the NHS guidance is feels hot to touch on the back of the hand. Uh, the NHS guidance has been very um, deliberate in not specifying a temperature, I think. Um, so, you know, 37.8, if they're above that, I will then tin panic them. Um, and again, make sure I'm using the clean probe and obviously make sure that I'm wiping down everything. Um, I do tend to wipe my thermometer between patients as well. Um, even though it's not touching them, I am getting quite close to them. Um, let's see what else people have done. Satan gives an incorrect reading, certainly does. Um, they are ineffective and there's government guidance saying it's not relied on, but because it's a mitigation measure and common practice, it'd be virtually negligent if you don't do it. Yep, uh, exactly that. So basically, the way I look at it is my client has asked me to do it. I have provided the service that my client has requested. I have provided my client with the temperatures. It is for my client to decide what they do with it. I never turn, turn anyone away from set. I never permit anyone on set. I say your temperature is below 37.8 and therefore production are happy for you to be on set. If somebody is above 37.8 and I do it tympanically and they're still above 37.8, I will go to production and say this person is reading above 37.8 and they will then say they need to go home. Okay, production has said you need to go home. That's not me making the decision, that is me carrying out the task I was asked to carry out, providing the information from that task to the person who asked me to carry out that task and they are then choosing how to act on that. Um, we remind people about wearing PPE. So we are now, we are probably the first people that, that are seen on set by everybody coming on, with the exception of the PM, that they, you know, we see them and then everybody sees us. Um, so we are quite often a good person to remind about PPE. Now obviously we're the medics, we're the ones who are used to wearing PPE and I'm seriously hoping everybody here has been trained in PPE. Um, so we know how to wear a surgical mask properly. We know which side of the surgical mask needs to be on the outside and which is on the inside and what that little solid piece here is for and why it's no use down here. Um, we know how to put gloves on and how to carefully remove gloves without contacting them. You've just seen me do a very quick demonstration there. And why it's important to sanitise your hands before you put your gloves on and why it's important to sanitise your hands after you remove gloves. We know why we put, you know, wash our hands, wet our hands, then apply the sanitizer, then do this, then turn our hands over and do this, then do it this way, then do our nails then rub our hands together, then do this, then include the wrists, and then thoroughly rinse our hands, and then use a paper towel to remove the excess moisture, not a hand dryer and not a shared towel. Um, we are the ones who, you know, already have the posters for how to wash our hands. So quite often, if I've got some of them posters knocking around, I'll bring them with me. Um, and I'll stick them up next to any taps in bathrooms or whatever. They happen to be ProMed branded, and I typically stick them up with a ProMed sticker. But, you know, brand awareness aside, you know, we are the ones who, you know, the PPE and the hand hygiene was our day-to-day -day life before COVID, actually. So we are kind of seen as the experts. So reminding people about wearing it and how to do it properly is is a good thing for us to be doing because we're the ones who actually do know how to do it because we've been doing it a lot more. Um, let's click. Um, reminding people about social distancing. So again, just as people are coming in, especially if they're queuing to see me and they're queuing on top of each other, yeah, you guys can just, you know, take a few steps back, two metres, please. You know, right, okay, as you're coming in, you've been queuing for two metres, 
thank you. You can just make sure you stay two meters apart when you're on set. Really good. Thank you very much. You know, again, it's just because we're the ones that are there, we're the ones people are seeing first. It's a little thing we can say. It doesn't cost us anything, but the COVID supervisor or the production manager is noticing that we're doing those little things and they want us back because we do those little things. Uh, with temperature screening, always create, keep a record. Who did you take the temperature of? What time period did you take that temperature? So is it call, is it lunch, is it ramp um, or any other time? Yes, I have worked for clients who want to done a wrap. No, don't ask me why. Do I agree with it? Well, you already know my views on temperature screening, so I'm, I'm not going to get, get into that debate. Um, so, yeah, we, we record that. So who it was, what temperature they were. Um, and we will have the call sheet to hand when we do that. So if the mobile number is not on the call sheet, we will ask them for their mobile number. If their name is not on the call sheet, we will absolutely make sure we get their name because actually those are the records that are going to be needed for test and trace, contact tracing, if anything goes wrong. I've discussed hand sanitizing. Now, again, these days I go to film sets, there's usually an extra two or three bottles of 70% alcohol hand sanitizer in the car. You know, I've never been to a production that's not provided it, but you know what, having an extra one in my pocket, it just means if somebody needs one there and then, yeah, yeah, I just borrow this, yeah, just give me it back at the end of the day. Um, I've, I've kept someone happy. Um, production, I've noticed I've kept somebody happy. Um, now, somebody mentioned somewhere about uh, rapid uh, testing. So, um, Nope, you shouldn't be asked to switch off tracking or Bluetooth when you're on site or on set. If you choose to use the test and trace app, uh, you, you can keep it on. I do not know anybody who turns their phone off on set these days. Your phone must, must, must be on silent, um, obviously. Um, but I've never had anybody turn off um, any kind of wireless connectivity or even go on flight mode or anything like that while they're on set. That's not a done thing in, in anywhere I've worked on. Um, but no, leaving, leaving that on. Um, again, I would never tell anybody to use test and trace. I would never tell anybody not to use test and trace. Um, how you as, a, as an adult, as a responsible citizen, choose to um, interact in society, that's between you, yourself, and nobody else. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not going to discuss anybody whether they do or they don't. It's, as far as I'm concerned, that's a personal choice. Um, now, the other thing that we can do as medics is we can assist with the testing process. So, um, if you have done the same training that, that the NHS have done, and I'm not going to um, say um, what well, I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say that I agree with the NHS's current training procedures um, or not. Um, but certainly um, certain trusts have got some publicly available videos and uh, there, there is a form at the end of it for um, trust staff to say that they have completed their training. I'm not going to name any trusts and I'm not going to express my opinion. Uh, you can work it out for yourself. Um, but, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if that is the NHS standard, if you are trained and qualified to insert nasal pharyngeal and oral pharyngeal airways and use suction. Well, your swab certainly isn't going any further than that. And if you have therefore completed the additional training that the NHS has provided for their personnel, then I am happy to allow you to do the swabbing for ProMed. Um, we do do some swabbing for people. So we do the swabbing both for antibody and antigen testing we also do the swabbing for rt pcr testing so antibody and antigen we can do as a point of care test we do have access to testing kits we can do them there and then they take 15 to 20 minutes however that does come with the caveat that um i can't remember offhand the antibody figures but certainly the antigen figures are only around about 80 percent sensitive so for those who haven't done a biomed degree like I have and want a quick crash course. So a specificity um, is about if that test is positive, that is the percentage of which will be from that particular thing they're testing for and not from anything else. 
So something that is 99.5% specific means that five times in every 1,000, it will give a positive result, but you will not be carrying or you will not have what that test was looking for. Um, whereas sensitive is the other way around. So a sensitive test uh, is picking up actual positive cases. So if something is 99.5% sensitive, five times in every thousand, somebody will be positive, but it will have shown them up to be negative. So the current point of care antigen tests, which is the ones that we're using to find out whether at that moment in time you do or you do not have it, are 80% sensitive. So what that means is 20% of the time they return a negative result, somebody could actually have what they were supposed to be looking for. Um, so my caveat with, with clients who are requesting that is a minimum of two tests from a minimum of two different batch numbers and we say a minimum of five days apart just because that's the incubation period that the government is advising you get retested at. So we tend to say um, day zero is the day before filming, day one is first filming day. So we tend to say day minus four and day one um, is when we would advise we do then. Uh, RT-PCR or real-time polymerase chain reaction. Um, again, for those of you without the biomed degrees, that is basically where we're looking for DNA or RNA, which is the genetic code, the sequence of bases, the specific biological molecule that tells the virus how to reproduce that code and how to reproduce its packaging. Um, it basically amplifies that in a constrained lab environment where it's killed because it gets broken down so it can't ever be put back together and reused so it's quite safe to do it that way um, it amplifies it and then it produces some um, it, it spreads out it used to be on a gel it's now all electronic and it basically puts bands of specific widths because uh, the way it works it basically cuts through the the DNA or the RNA, whatever molecule they're doing it, it cuts at specific code markers. So depending on where those code markers are, you might have lots of small bits or you might have some big chunks and that then produces a specific pattern and, and that pattern is then very reliable. And if you use lots of what we call primers, the combination of primers that you use, which is what looks for where it makes the cut, um, the more of them you use and the more different ones you use, the more confident you are that your final readout is absolutely going to be that. For those of you who do computing and you use um, hashes and checksums, it's kind of similar analogy to that, basically, um, in terms of the final output. Um, so we tend to recommend that because it's a lot more sensitive and specific. Um, but the downside is you need a lab. Now, there are companies out there who can bring a mobile lab to you. And certainly we can do RT-PCR in about an hour um, when it's in a lab. Uh, but it does require specialist lab equipment. It does require high voltage electricity for cer certain um, applications. Um, quite often it's, it's couriering. So well, the model we tend to use with our clients is either they can use their own labs or we have... Um, a network of companies and labs that we would use. We would obtain their testing kit from that lab, or we, we can keep stock for people. Um, we will uh, go and do that swab, and then we will courier that to um, a UCAS um, ISO certified lab. So UCAS is Net King of Accreditation Service. So again, um, I am a licensed head of the Institute of Biomedical Scientists, so I do pride myself on, on upholding um, their code of conduct. Uh, so even though I'm not a registered biomedical scientist in, in respect of the, the HCPC, I am still a licensee of the IBMS, which is my professional organization in that respect, and I therefore still abide by their code of conduct. And then one thing that you know that they're, they're quite clear on is that you know any, any testing facilities um, for you know biological matter, 
um, for biomedical testing needs to be in a UCAS accredited lab. So whilst the COVID specific tests might not necessarily have been through a UCAS and ISO testing procedure, the fact that the lab is UCAS, the fact that the lab adheres to ISO standards, they cannot possibly run any other test without still adhering to their quality management system because otherwise they would lose that accreditation. So when we've been choosing our laboratory partners, um, when I tasked um, my team to find those, I was absolutely crystal clear that I want their UCAS numbers. I want to know what ISO standards, what British standards they have been assessed against. And I want their document of conformance to, to evidence that. Um, because, you know, my name is the managing director of ProMed. Uh, my name appears on the register of IBMS members. Um, and it doesn't take much to put two and two together. And, you know, somebody could report me to the IBMS if, if I'm not adhering to the code of conduct. Um, and I do take my professional responsibilities quite seriously there. And that's why I've actually spent a little bit of time just explaining about those different tests and, and what they mean. And if anybody does have any questions around the testing, please do feel free to ask me um, because, you know, this is an area that I, I do have a degree in. This is an area that I can explain and I am actually quite passionate um, about making sure people understand what they're getting and how they should be using it um, because, you know, it is, it is my profession at the end of the day. Whilst I'm not a registered healthcare professional, I, I still do have a, a professional membership with a professional organisation. I am quite passionate about that. So that brings us to the end of working on TV and film production sets. So we've looked at the departments, we've looked at the terminology, we've looked at radio communications, expectations of medics, and we're finished off with a little bit on COVID. Um, so we have overran by half an hour, so I do apologise if anybody um, had any hot dates tonight, if anybody has been on a promise and has um, stood anybody up, I do apologise. Um, Certainly, if you live in my area, there was no hope of that because, you know, we're in tier three. So unless we live with someone, we weren't doing none of that anyway. Um, so thank you very much for staying. Um, please email webinars at pride999.co.uk with your phone name if you would like a CPD certificate. We are going to verify that you're in this session throughout. So you did have to log in with an email address that can register with Zoom, which means if you then email us from a different email um, or you've used a different name to what Zoom has you down as, please tell us which one it is because we are going to verify that. Um, we did have somebody this week ask us for um, a certificate from the last session. Uh, they were turned down because according to Zoom, they were never in it. Um, in fact, they'd only ever turned up to one session, and that was two months ago. So we do check registers before um, we issue certificates again. We do take our responsibilities seriously. <laughs> um, we're going to verify that you've left us a review. I'll move on to that in a moment. And we'll get these out to you within three business days. Now, a business day is not a Saturday or a Sunday. I am going to say that there might be a slight delay because um, all of admin team um, are on a training course this weekend. We're doing our safe uh, supervising mental uh, supervising first aid for mental health level three qualification on Saturday and Sunday um, and um, the majority of us are also working on set tomorrow so this this webinar is very appropriate time for us guys um, so it may be Monday or Tuesday when we do get around to issuing the digits to get out to you um, we may do a mental health webinar in the near future depending on uh, how our how our course goes this weekend if it's something you're interested in please do let us know so tonight um, your webinar has indeed been provided free of charge same as every week and we are planning on continuing our free webinar series for the foreseeable future in return for taking advantage of my brain and our time uh, and expertise, we would ask that you leave us one review. Um, Trustpilot is our preferred site, uh, but if you've already left us one on Trustpilot, please do leave us one on Yelp. If you've already left us one on Trustpilot and Yelp, then head to Google. If you've left us one on Trustpilot, Yelp and Google, then please finally head over to Facebook. And if you've left one on all four, thank you very much. You are incredibly kind people. We really do enjoy you. Um, we do have some more webinars coming up in the near future. Um, so our current projected webinar series is 
Next week, we're going to be looking at safety considerations for medical providers at events and incidents. On the 12th, we're going to be looking at the safety critical communications protocols. And on the 19th, we're going to be looking at the time phases of major incidents. Uh, we will then also be running on the 26th of November. On the 3rd of December, 10th and 17th of December also. But we have decided in the interests of our own health and well-being and our families, of course, that we're going to take the 24th and 31st of December off also because they tend to be quite operationally busy days. Um, so if you do have any questions, if you have any suggestions for any future webinars, please do ask away. If you want to raise your hand, we'll invite you to unmute yourself and we can have a nice little chat. Um, nice two-way dialogue is all really good. Um, otherwise, um, enter them in the chat and I will reply to them uh, by reading out your question and reading out the answer. Uh, the link to tonight's slide is not the one that admin team posted. That is from a webinar a little while ago. We've not actually uploaded tonight's slides. Uh, that's my fault because I didn't finish them until after six o'clock, so admin team didn't really get a fair chance. Uh, we are on YouTube, of course. Admin team has posted that link to the chat, so please subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Join the 180 people who get notified of our videos when we upload them every Friday. Uh, John, Katie, you're very welcome. Uh, Chris, um, yep, yeah, great to hear that you're interested in working for us. That's excellent. Um, looks like you might know Mick. Um, we know Mick. Mick's uh, very good. Mick recently uh, completed his threat qualification via us. Uh, Nathan, um, you're very welcome. I'm pleased to learn a lot tonight. Uh, Neil, answered your question. Uh, Shanai, I'm hoping I pronounced that right. You're very welcome. I'm glad it was informative. Um, Chris, thank you for the review. Um, Brian, yes, uh, if you've got any queries about any training courses you would like to do, uh, drop us an email, training at proled999.co.uk. Uh, Brian, um, thank you for mentioning the team that I couldn't do this without uh, the you now three of them that are logged on helping me out every week. Um, we have a half an hour before and about 10 minutes after everything as well. Um, you know, admin team really do a lot of work behind the scenes for these webinars. So thank you for acknowledging that. Uh, Jenny, um, yes, absolutely. Um, David tells me that you know we're, we're pretty much got you onboarded and um, you'll see from the text we're sending out there is stuff. We've got a lot of stuff. Um, We've got a lot of inquiries out there. We are talking to quite a few people in different parts of the country at the moment. Uh, Chris, that's really good to hear. Um, likewise, myself, um, I'm, I really do need to, to actually talk to Qual Safe. The only reason I'm not is because I'm not actually going around talking to them. Um, it will be of interest to us. Uh, where are you based, Chris? That'll tell, tell us how, how much interest we are. Uh, Dominic, um, you are also very welcome. Uh, Ruth, yes, we, we are looking for staff in Scotland. Uh, we, we have had a couple of inquiries for film and TV in Scotland already uh, this week. Uh, Chris, London, excellent. Yes, we, we do have a need for, um, for sort of unit medics and also of um, of um, trainers in, in the London area. I'm, I'm getting lost with my words. Um, that's great, Ruth. Thank you for sending that email. Uh, uh, Andrew, I believe it's QR off solutions. Great to hear. Uh, Chris, if, if Mick will vouch for you, that's excellent. Ashley, do we do much work in Yorkshire? Uh, most of the admin team uh, either live in or around um, Yorkshire. Um, so yes, um, we do have work in Yorkshire. We are speaking to a few event providers in Yorkshire. Um, obviously can't name them at the moment um, because um, confidentiality um, and sort of commercial sensitivity there. But we are talking to event providers across the Yorkshire area. Um, we last did an event in uh, West Yorkshire technically, Weatherby, um, in July. Uh, the reason we haven't done any in Yorkshire since is because all of the ones that we had contracts with um, went into sort of local lockdown or bordered local lockdown or high restrictions or whatever and the local authorities basically put the kibosh on them um, so we're literally just waiting on, on things to ease again and local authorities to say yeah go for it and, and then our client will give us the new dates. Uh, Declan uh, you're very welcome. 
Um, not seeing any questions though. Um, so speak now or forever hold your peace, guys. Um, in in the absence, um, Promet Admin Team is just going to pop the links once again to the Trustpilot, uh, Facebook, Google, and Yale um, webinars at promet999.co.uk if you want a CPD certificate. There's your links for the reviews. And also, uh, the other thing just to add there is our social media links are going to appear in the chat from admin team in a moment, I'm sure. So please do give us a follow on all the social media channels. Uh, we are just looking to boost ourselves a little bit more. I'm going to leave these live for um, another few minutes till quarter two, so you've got time to click on any links. Um, Brian, equivalence between Freck 3 and First Aid at Work. Freck 3 far, far, far surpasses First Aid at Work. Um, there's an additional two days for one thing, um, but um, there's a lot more about trauma, there's a lot more about um, patient assessment, a lot more about observations, a lot more covering the anatomy and physiology, um, the, the focus on why we do high quality BLS. Um, look on our website, promed999.co.uk forward slash training forward slash FREC. Um, we'll give you a very good breakdown of what is covered on FREC 3. We've kind of taken quality of specification and wrote it in a much more human friendly language. First aid on steroids, uh, yeah, and the rest. Um, it is basically the first step on, on the pathway to frontline work. Um, it is the first step on the pathway to responding to calls for medical assistance rather than being the block in the workplace who will put a bandage on if someone's bleeding. Um, Nathan, um, I've not yet eaten actually. Um, I've got some mints um, and some fajitas um, knocking around. So I'm going to very quickly toss some mints off, throw some spices and some beans at it, uh, chop up a little bit of lettuce, bit of sour cream, uh, grate some cheese, um, and you know, quickly put some uh, tortilla wraps in the oven, uh, roll them up, and um, and that's going to be my evening meal. And um, whatever I've got left, I'll uh, pop in the fridge, and that'll be something I might want to get back from the mental health course. Um, Ruth, yes, ab absolutely. Um, what I tend to find with nurses is they especially ward nurses, they become very specialised on what their ward is specialised in, uh, whereas the frac path, by its very nature, by the nature of the fact you can be called to almost anything, is very generalist and it covers lots and lots of different things. Yeah, of course, if you're an AME, then um, yeah, you're also very generalist. You cover, you know, all body systems all the time. Um, I, I had a whole bunch of paediatric nurses who work in an adult and child major trauma centre, uh, A&E. Um, I love them a bit. Um, because they're, they're not only no adults because they are present in adult resource, so although they're not treating the adults, they are present in adult resource, and they are, their patients still actually go up to 18 years old, um, but they also know all of the child physiological parameters by heart because their patients can go down to, you know, the day after they were born. Um, and, you know, they're an a &E, so they get everything from my child has a grazed finger because they, they fell and, and they hurt their hand, uh, right through to, uh, you know, the 13 year old was mountain biking in the forest and has rolled over and has hit their head and, you know, there's there's a piece of bicycle sticking through their leg because it was flown in by the air ambulance. Um, so they get a lot of exposure. Um, however, the, the ward nurses that I know tend to be really, really focused on what their wards do. Um, but yeah, no, you do learn a lot from FREC3. Uh, you know, my biomed degree obviously covered a hell of a lot of anatomy and physiology, and it's always really good to learn the application of that. Um, what I find with the FREC course is it teaches me a lot of application uh, for the theory that I learned on my degree. Um, so I'm going to shut up. I'm going to take myself off video. I'm going to give you one more minute, and then we're going to uh, wave goodbye to everybody. So thanks for coming along tonight, and I will speak to you all next week. Uh, Thursday the 5th of November at 7pm.